Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you would like to jump to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen, which will reveal the chapter titles and links to the starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I want to offer a few resources for newer knitters or knitters who are new to internet knitting communities. And then I want to talk about my Finish It February projects. So let's get started. So this first tidbit is just a follow-up on a tidbit I told you guys about a couple of weeks ago. I was mentioning that there was going to be a presentation on interwar knitting patterns in magazines. And it was presented yesterday afternoon here in the US, but it was actually done in the UK. So it was in the evening um, in the UK. And the woman presenting it was Dr. Eleanor Reed. And she does research and she's gonna have a book coming out soon on these uh, domestic magazines in the first half of the 20th century. Well, she's a knitter and so she's always really interested to see the knitting patterns that show up in these magazines. And so she was giving us examples of the kinds of things, the kinds of magazines that there, that there were and the different socioeconomic groups that they were aimed at and then the types of uh, patterns that began to appear uh, for knitting and why that really changed after World War I um, going into the 1920s. And so she was focusing on the 1920s and 30s, but she gave some background on what was in those magazines in the first 10 or 20 years of the 20th century and how those were tended to be more uh, crochet patterns rather than knitting patterns that up until World War I, knitting was seen as a really practical um, domestic art that it was made, uh, it was used to make things to keep you warm. So sweaters, which were athletic garments, as I've mentioned many times in those early years. Um, so sweaters were meant um, to keep you warm. There's stockings and socks and mittens and hats and petticoats and things like that. So they were very practical items where crochet items were often made with thread, was used to beautify the home uh, or your clothing, whereas knitting was very practical. And I thought that was really interesting. And now she's talking about this from the perspective of what was going on in the UK. And one of the reasons that she gave for why crochet was so much more popular was that Queen Victoria was an avid crocheter. Now Queen Victoria also knit, but apparently she wasn't nearly as good a knitter as she was crocheter. So people have, uh, were trying to emulate her and, and copy her and do what she did. So that was one of the reasons I mentioned that crochet was so popular at least in the UK, I would be really curious to know what the balance was of crochet and knitting. I certainly do have observed in the antique knitting manuals that th these items typically were practical. They were for, for athletic garments. They were to keep your feet warm. They were to keep your head warm. So they did record it. I will leave that down below if you're interested in seeing it. One of the things that she offered up was a little booklet that she put together of images of different sweaters that were in these magazines and then examples of the stitch patterns. So the patterns themselves, the physical patterns that she was using for her research are the property of the Knitting and Crochet Guild in the UK. And so the access to those are, um, booklets are only available to members. Now I'm a member, I joined sometime last year because they do have this incredible archives and a lot of it has been digitized. So if you are a member, you can access those things often digitally. You don't have to do it in person. You don't have to be in the UK. I will leave also information about the Knitting and Crochet Guild down below. So this next tidbit is a link to a video. It's here on YouTube. And it came to me uh, in my Ravelry group. Uh, one of my viewers uh, posted a link and said, this is really interesting. And it's a, a woman who only has one arm. She had her arm uh, was amputated because she had cancer. And so it was removed. And one of her very first concerns was, am I still going to be able to knit? And these are the kinds of things I think about 
um, often is what happens if I go blind? Will I still be able to knit? What happens if this happens? You know, if this, if I have this kind of injury or this kind of disability, will I still be able to knit? And how will I do that? I do. It does run through my mind sometimes. So, and I've seen people posting on Ravelry over the years, asking for tips or suggestions for uh, acquaintances or friends or family members that they're trying to help uh, learn to knit with only one hand. So if this is a situation that, that you're in where you know somebody who used to be able to knit and um, only has one hand available to them, I would really suggest watching this video. But I would also suggest watching it regardless because this woman has combined a couple of really ingenious tools and techniques to solve this knitting problem for herself. And I just thought it was amazing. So the first thing she did was she got a knitting belt. So in the past, knitting belts were a very common piece of equipment that knitters had. They used very long double pointed needles and they would anchor the right hand needle into the knitting belt and that would hold that steady so they didn't have to hold the needle. And that would allow them to, and then they could uh, loop their knitting into, into the belt too, so that would take the weight off and they could walk down uh, the road and knit while they were carrying baskets of peat on their heads, for example. So they could continue to work and do whatever they needed while um, being able to, to knit as soon as um, they didn't have to have their hands occupied in some other task. So she anchors her right needle in a knitting belt and it was an interesting knitting belt. I, she didn't say where she got it, uh, like what company she got it from, but she did mention that the woman who makes those knitting belts is here in Minnesota. And what was interesting about that knitting belt is that the holes, there were a variety of different sizes where most knitting belts I've seen have had small holes and it really meant for finer gauge needles. That was traditionally what people knit was was things on really fine gauges. Um, so that was something I thought um, made it even more accessible um, to a wider range of knitters is that if you needed to use uh, larger needles, you could still do that with this particular knitting belt. Then she had to figure out how to manage the yarn and um, create the stitches with her other hand. So she was gonna have to hold the, the left hand needle and the yarn and manage the stitches all with her left hand. So I don't know if she was originally right-handed or left-handed, but it was her right arm that had been amputated. So what she came up with was using Portuguese knitting. So Portuguese knitting is a, a method where the yarn is tensioned in one of two ways. One is you can wrap it around the neck and that's what tensions it. And so the yarn is basically coming from your body and that's, and, uh, and you manipulate the stitches that way. And so the, the yarn is always in front. So you do your knit stitches and your purl stitches with the yarn in front. So if you've ever done a Norwegian purl where you kept the yarn in back while you were doing a purl stitch, it's the same idea only in reverse that you can do a knit stitch while the yarn is in front. So one method, as I mentioned, of tensioning the yarn is around the neck. The other is to have this kind of pin attached to your clothing and the yarn, it goes through there. And so it's tensioned um, through that pin instead. And that's the method that she chose. And she demonstrated how she, you know, does the knit stitch and she did it very slowly. And then she says, and then pretty soon you can just speed up. And she was zipping along, zip, 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 zip. So she obviously was a competent knitter before and has continued to be competent knitted, a competent knitter um, going forward, even with the loss of her arm. So if any of you will find that interesting, I will leave the link down in the video description. So this next tidbit is something that came across my Twitter feed. Um, it's about temperature scarves and climate change. So in the past few years, every year I hear people talking about, oh, they want to do a temperature blanket or they want to do a temperature scarf or something like that. And the, I, the, the concept of that is that you look at the place that you live and what the temperatures are either you could either do the average temperature um, per day or you could do the low and the high or there, there's various different ways you can do this but the idea is you knit one row each day based on what the temperature is and so you can see 
uh, what things, uh, how the temperature changes over the course of the year. And so you have blue colors for the cold and maybe get into white or, or green or something, but, and then up to reds and yellows and oranges and, and things like that. And so you, you pick, depending on how extreme the temperatures are where you live, um, you pick um, certain colors to do certain ranges of temperatures. So people have been doing this for, I don't know, five, 10 years, I think is when I, I have, when I first heard about this type of thing. Um, but this article was about a woman who was doing research on climate change and was doing a presentation and she wanted to try to ex explain in a tactile way how the climate the, has changed over the course of the 400 years from 1600 to like 2000. And so she took the average like temperature, global temperature uh, for a year. And so every row was a year and it represented the entire world. Uh, and she made this blanket. And so there were periods of times where that were a couple of hot years or some very, very cold years. Um, but you can really see over the course of that 400 years um, how the climate has changed. And, I, and she said when she did the presentation, there was such a, a visceral reaction to it when people saw this physical item and they came up afterwards and were touching it and looking at it and it really felt like it connected with them. And so I thought that was really interesting and I'm going to leave a link to that article down below. So this next tidbit is a video, it was a video plus a Wikipedia article that I'm gonna to link to you. So the video is from a channel called Veritasium. It's a science-based channel that I've been subscribed to for many, many years. Uh, and I was watching the latest episode like a week or so ago, and he was exploring these brightly colored pools of water that were in the middle of the Utah desert and wondering why are these here and what are they for? And it, in it, the long story short, it's very interesting. So I would re totally recommend watching it. The gist of it is, is those are pools of liquid potassium mining, basically. It's a very dangerous prospect to actually go underground and mine uh, potassium. It's very volatile and you can explode things very easily. And what they found is if you can dissolve it with other things and then let it evaporate, you can collect on this potassium. And the reason it's so important is it creates what is called pot ash, which I had heard of before, but I never knew what it was. So when potassium was discovered to be an element, the man who named it called it pot ashium. So that's where potassium gets its name from. And, but this video goes on to explain all of the uses that we have for different types of potassium compounds, I guess would be uh, the word. Uh, you don't, we don't ever use pure potassium, just can't, it doesn't exist very well. And so it's always a compound of some sort. Uh, so I was watching this video and I thought it was really interesting. They, they learned that if you mixed it with like animal fat, with, um, pot ash, you could get like a liquid soap. If you mix it with water and some bat guano, then you get this uh, fertilizer, which helped to grow uh, more uh, crops more efficiently. So there were just this endless number of uses for it. It became incredibly important to human civilization. And, but the way that they got it was by burning hardwood until it formed ash. And so there are these giant factories, the whole purpose, was to burn up wood to create pot ash. So I grew up in Michigan, which um, before the Europeans came um, to settle it was wall to wall trees. And so a lot of them were cut down and that was, you know, a lot of people got rich. They were big tim uh, lumber barons. I never once knew that the reason they were getting rich is because it was being used um, to create pot ash. I assumed it was being used as lumber to build houses or build buildings or uh, maybe as, as uh, firewood or something. I never once knew anything about its use as pot ash. There is a connection to knitting. So I was looking up pot ash in the Wikipedia and they were talking about all these different uses for it and they were talking about 
potash pits that could be found uh, all over England and they were always near a wooded area. And sometimes these potash pits were used to wash wool. So they would shear the sheep and they would take the fleece and they would soak it in this potash and animal fat mixture, which was a liquid soap, and that helped scour the fleece. And then they would also have these pits where they would do dyeing of the wool, which also used another form of potash. <laughs> it was fascinating to me, I had no idea. So I'm gonna leave a link also to the Wikipedia article. So it, it, to me, it's just a fascinating bit of human history that I had no idea of, but then there's this connection to knitting as well. So the past couple of weeks, uh, our Knitters Guild has been uh, hosting a Zoom uh, social knitting gathering. So it's not part of our monthly programs. It's just a way to get together socially and uh, talk to other knitters, share what we we're working on, see what other people are working on. It's, it's been really wonderful. I've had so much fun. On Sunday, uh, one of the people, her name is Corey. She's also known as I Rock Knits. Uh, she's a knit designer here in the Twin Cities. She was showing us this tube of knitting that she had a friend of hers has a circular sock machine and Corey said you know she's got 50 pairs of socks she doesn't need to knit any more socks but she had the sock yarn and she wanted to turn them into something but she didn't want to knit a bunch of stockinette uh, tubes so she gave the yarn to her friend to uh, crank on her circular sock machine uh, just to make a big tube so her friend started off with some waist yarn and then cranked the entire uh, skein of fingering weight yarn of whatever colorway it was, then did some more waist yarn, and then did the next one. So she did like two or three uh, different uh, balls of sock yarn. And so then what Corey uh, was going to do, I think she was going to turn a couple of them into some socks. Um, so she just cut them where the waist, waist yarn was and then, you know, opened up where she's going to put the heel and ripped back um, where the live stitches were and, until she could then, you know, create a towel or something like that. I don't know. Maybe she used contrast yarn for the heels. I don't, I don't really know. Uh, but she, so she had all this and she was mentioning something about, oh yeah, uh, a lot of indie dyers have these uh, sock cranking or tube cranking services. And, and I was like, what? what do you what and so she started explaining that there are independent dyers who have bought circular sock machines in order to quickly knit up samples of the yarns that they dye so that people can see how they actually knit up like if they're doing self-striping yarns or something like that so you can see what it looks like so they don't have to actually knit up uh, sock after sock after sock with all their different colorways and so they would just use these circular sock machines to do that and some of them have turned that into a service where if you want to buy their yarn for an extra like ten dollar uh, fee they will uh, crank it for you in a tube and they'll hold back a certain amount of it if you want like 10 or 20 grams to do the toes or the heels or they can do the whole thing um, but if you need a so the tube cranking service for yarn that you didn't buy from them you can send it to them and then they'll charge like fifteen dollars or something to do it and and i and i thought that's that's fascinating to me like this this whole like idea that it never occurred to me and she's like yeah a lot of people you know they bought a lot of sock yarn and they're trying to figure out what to do with it you know so they get it cranked in the tubes it just made me think because I have quite a bit of sock yarn that is not self-striping when I thought I was going to do a lot of more textured socks so I bought all of these solid colors and I'm not going to use them for that and I thought that could be a really interesting thing to do is send a bunch of that solid color yarn that I'm not going to personally knit into socks and have them knit into tubes and then I'll just insert heels maybe. A couple of people in the group had heard of this before and one of them mentioned um, a company called Knit Spin Farm and I did look on Etsy. There are a lot of people on Etsy who do this as well and, and the 
Going rate seems to be between $15 and $18 if you're sending them yarn. Uh, and I think if you send them a lot, then they might get you some kind of discount or, or something. But anyway, if that is something that is appealing to you is to just have those cranked out, um, you might be interested in that. And the thing that, that I was wary of is that I'm aware that circular sock machines tend to have a certain number of needles. And so for me, knowing that it has 64 stitches isn't helpful if I don't know what the gauge is. And so apparently there is some control over the gauge. Like they can kind of, some of them are very good at and can kind of tweak a specific gauge. Um, and the idea would be whatever gauge it comes back, then you need to match that with your hand knitting when you're doing the toes or the cuffs or, or whatever, um, which is fine. I, I can totally on board with that. So I thought that was really interesting and it's something I'm going to look into, um, maybe not right away, but just something I'm glad I know about and I thought I'd let you guys know about it as well. I get questions sometimes from new knitters who are, don't understand some of the vocabulary that might, might, might be using or a term I might be using and they might ask that question. So I want to give you guys some resources that are good for helping you figure things out if you hear a knitting term that you're unfamiliar with or, or with me if I say something you're like what does that mean? You probably get a much faster answer if you um one one way is to google it but google it in a specific way so i've been talking a lot with finish it february about ufos and the first time i mentioned ufo this year somebody asked what does ufo mean and i'm like oh i guess i need to explain that and so i've been trying to make sure that since every time after that then when i say ufo i also say unfinished object so that people who are new to that concept will understand it. But I'm not going to do that every time. Sometimes I just won't even think of it. So the tip is that when you hear something like that, and it's a term, especially one that you've heard outside of the context of knitting, is you type the word knitting, and then you ask your question, like knitting, what is a UFO? Because if you just type, what is a UFO, you're gonna get all things about flying saucers, and you know that that's not what I'm talking about. So a lot of times if you are looking for something specific, just use the word knitting before you ask the question. But there are some websites that can be really good for, for finding out information about knitting abbreviations or knitting terms. There is a website that is maintained by the Craft Yarn Council. So that is a consortium of businesses related to the yarn craft industry. So book publishers, tool producers, uh, yarn manufacturers, and even the two largest uh, manufacturers of acrylic fiber in the world are members of the Craft Yarn Council. So their goal is to sell more yarn. <laughs> and so one of the ways they do that is by educating knitters or yarn crafters in different ways. So they have a, a series of pages on their website that help you understand what the standards are that, that they have developed. And they, they developed a system of yarn categories that are numbered. So if you buy yarn at a big box store, you will usually see uh, a number on it, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that gives you a general idea of what yarn categories are in. That doesn't mean that any yarn that's in the in category four is really a, a fine substitute for any other yarn in the category four. It just is a general uh, way of approaching it. Um, it's better than nothing, but it's not ideal. But also on this website, is information on how to read a knitting pattern and a list of common abbreviations and what they mean, um, standard sizing information. Some people have issues with those standard sizes, but it's something to start with. So that website is, is, can be useful as long as you understand that it's not uh, gospel. Uh, but it's a good place to start, especially with abbreviations and things like how to read patterns and what does this term mean, that sort of thing. So I'm going to leave a link to the Craft Yarn Council down in the video description. 
Monday was February 1st, so that was the official first day of Finish It February. And many of you are enthusiastically working on your projects. There is a link to, I'll put a link to the discussion thread for Finish It February, and you can see all of the things that people are working on, the kinds of progress they're making. Um, I'll leave that down in the video description. So I, uh, I have four projects for Finish It February. Uh, one of them is a pair of socks I actually just started a couple of weeks ago. And because there are two socks in that project, uh, I, what I like to do when I uh, have a bunch of things I'm, I'm wanting to finish is I do like to rotate through them and to kind of keep my interest and excitement and motivation um, working on them. Normally, when I'm not in a Finish It February, I'm working on a project and I work on that project and only that project until I either get sick of it and put it to the side or I finish it or I'm having trouble with it and it needs a time out. Occasionally, I will pause it for a few days to work a very quick project like a hat or something like that. Um, but really, I stick with a project usually for three weeks and if it's not done, I put it to the side for a while. Um, but in Finish It February, I do like to look at all the things I have and figure out how I'm gonna keep this um, exciting and interesting for me. Because these are all things that I put to the side for, for some reason in general. So one of them is a pair of socks. I had started them a couple weeks ago. I knit the foot, I just turned the heel, and I got very interested in that heel and exploring other ways of working it. This is a heel uh, that was new to me that I found in uh, a book I was telling you guys about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's this um, a Sock Knitter's Workshop. So it was a heel I found. I thought it was really interesting. I wanted to try it. Uh, and then I went, then I spent about a week trying to figure out how to improve it. And once I figured that out, I did the, that was the video I posted on Tuesday, the Technique Tuesday video, which is a mock short row heel. Um, so it uses decreases to shape the first half of the heel. And then as you work back and forth for the second half of the heel, you work each row one stitch longer by picking up a stitch along the edge of the first half. So I had to abandon that sock, the, the pair, when I'd gotten, ha you know, just through the foot. So I, uh, last weekend I worked on the leg and then Monday, when Finish It February started, I finished that first sock. So I consider that a sub-project. For me, the sock has two sub-projects, the first sock and the second sock. So I finished the first sock and now I can do something else and I will return and do the second sock later this month. Another project I have is a more of a fix it February. So sometimes I use February to fix things that I've had for a while. I've one year, I had lost a button on a sweater and I didn't like any of those buttons. I never had liked them. So I bought new buttons and I sewed on um, new buttons to that. And that was just a task that I'd been putting off and putting off and putting off for months. And I thought it's finished in February, I'm gonna do this. So this year I have a sweater coat that I've been wearing for a few years that the cuffs were getting frayed because they'd kind of gotten singed when I was cooking and they got caught on things that I walked by and I had leftover yarn and so I wanted to fix those but I also wanted to enhance it and so one of the things that bugged me about that coat was that it, it didn't there was no closure for it, it just hung open and I tried like shawl pins to keep it closed, but it's a bulky weight yarn, so it's kind of too heavy for that. It didn't, didn't work that well. And when I need to take the sweater off, I have to do something with the shawl pin. I treat this like my wintertime, daytime uh, bathrobe. So I want belt loops and a belt. So a while ago, I knit a belt. I made it only as, as long as it absolutely had to be to work because I, I wasn't sure how much yarn I had to fix the cuffs. But now I fixed the cuffs. I have plenty of yarn. It's going to extend the length of that belt. I put one belt loop on. I'm going to need to put another belt loop. So that's a fix it thing I have to do. And then the other two things are two sweaters. An Aran sweater I designed a couple of years ago and have been knitting intermittently. Um, the front and the back were done. I need to do the two sleeves and the collar. And then the final thing is one of my antique sweaters. I was working on this antique sweater pattern from the 1890s. The whole sweater's done except for one sleeve. 
So for me, the sub projects for the Aran sweater are the first sleeve, uh, the second sleeve and the neck. So, and then I have to do some seaming because I did knit these pieces flat. And I'm going to talk about the decision process behind behind that, why I did that. So I have two sleeves, a neck, and the seaming to do on that sweater, and then just the sleeve uh, for the second sweater. So I've been working on the sleeve. I was making some pretty good progress, and then yesterday I had to rip out everything. <laughs> everything that I had knit yesterday like it was like I it was like one mistake after the other so I could ignore the first mistake and oh that's fine oh here I'm gonna do this oh it's it's okay I can I can compensate for it this way and then at the end of the day I saw that there was a big old uh <laughs> miscross cable in there now any one of those errors I could have dealt with like the miscross cable, I could ladder it down to where the problem was and then re-knit all the way back up correctly. But because I'd done that miscross cable, that compounded some of the other issues I had with the decreases on the side. And it just, it was, I'm like, I can't, this too many mistakes. So I ripped back everything that I had done yesterday. I woke up at three o'clock this morning, couldn't get back to sleep. And so I was knitting uh, and got caught up to where I was. This is the, the body right here. It's gonna be very dark and hard to see on camera. Uh, so I have that center panel, that cable in the center. This is a kind of a cable where you can add stitches in certain multiples and make that panel wider and wider. And you can also make it a little bit narrower, and which is what I did in order to create the cable down the front of, um, or down the center of the sleeve. When I designed the sweater, I designed it to knit it flat from the body, from the bottom up my preferred method of knitting sweaters, especially something that has a very basic shape like this. And the reason I like doing that is because I can get all of these cables, there are all these different cables established and just focus on that. I don't have to worry about any neck shaping or armhole shaping or anything like that. I can, I'm just knitting straight all the way up until I get to the armholes. By the time I get to the underarms, I understand the pattern and then it's very easy to do the decreases. And then I get up to the very top where all the neck shaping and the shoulder shaping is and that's where it gets complicated. But by then I understand the stitch patterns. So I don't have to focus on that. I can focus on other aspects. If I start at the shoulders and knit down, I have to keep track of all the shaping while I'm establishing the, the patterns. And I can do it, but I don't find that enjoyable. So for me, I want to do bottom up. Now I want to do flat because I don't like having the entire thing on my lap. I like smaller pieces. The rows are shorter. I feel like I'm making progress faster. Uh, and I can see if something's working or not sooner. I can get through a repeat or two and see if I, things are actually working the way I want them to, uh, rather than having to do the entire round twice as many stitches for that length before I would realize this is not working. So I just prefer smaller pieces. And then also, because this is a cabled pattern, these uh, cables are what are called traveling cables. So it's like they're little ropes of two knit stitches and that travel across that background of pearls. So every right side row so those ropes are moving. Not every rope is moving. Sometimes they're going straight, but there's always things crossing on every right side row. That means that I know on a wrong side row, I can just knit my knits and purl my pearls and I don't have to worry about it. If I'm knitting in the round and doing this kind of cabling, I have to pay attention to whether is this a crossing row for anything or not. So I'm much more likely to make errors in crossing a row too early or a row too late if I'm knitting these kinds of cables in the round. So I would just assume avoid making, um, avoid mistakes that I know are going to happen and just deal with the mistakes that happen without me planning on them. So I knit the, the bodies, uh, the back uh, bottom up and the front bottom up, I've joined them. And so the next step was to figure out how I wanted to knit the sleeve. So again, I had the choice of flat or in the round. 
and I wasn't entirely sure there's some when it comes to a sleeve there's some because of the, all the shaping there are some advantages to knitting in the round even though you still have that disadvantage of maybe crossing a cable on the wrong row uh, with knitting in the round when you do your decreases technically you're doing them at the beginning of the round and the end of the round I like to do mine so at the end of a at the end of a round and then a couple stitches later it's the beginning of the next round do do the second increase and those are actually visually right next to each other on that same plane uh, and it makes it very easy to remember to do both of them uh, where when you're knitting flat and you're doing your decreases at the beginning of a row and the end of the row it's very easy to go oh yeah this is a decrease row I'm going to do my decrease and now I'm going to do all this do my cable crossings oh now it's the seed stitch da, 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 no, I'm not thinking about it. I'm just going to knit to the end and then knit back the other way and pretty soon you know you've <laughs> you've got you've got one edge that's going like this and the other edge that's staying straight so I did have that problem with the sleeve where I was forgetting to do some decreases and trying to compensate for that and then and then when I made more and more mistakes and skipped rows and I'm like okay <laughs> I have to come up with a different uh, system for keeping track of what I'm doing uh, and ripped it back and then and re-knit it so the other thing that I needed to decide was am I going to knit this from the cuff up or am I going to knit it from the sleeve down? So the body was knit from the bottom up and I have this cable pattern. But the nice thing about a lot of cables is that they look the same right side up as they look upside down. So I'm gonna shift to overhead and show you uh, what I'm talking about. So here we have this cable where we have these two cables right here that cross to the left and then we have the single one in the middle that that one crosses to the right. And if you look at the ropes, anytime you cross over a rope, if I look at this rope, it's crossing over. And now the next time it has to cross, it's going under. And now it's got to go over. And so that's, that's how these, these cables intertwine. So again, the, the two are crossing to the left and the single is crossing to the right. So now I look at them, uh, the two again are crossing to the left and the single is crossing to the right. So this can be knit in either direction. It doesn't matter. I don't have to worry about the directionality of this particular stitch pattern. If somebody gets very, very close, they might be able to look for the V's of the stitches. So let me turn it back this way. So if you look at the stitches that make up this rope, you can see there is a V here and a V here. It's kind of hard to see. This is a dark yarn and it's fuzzy because it's a woolen spun yarn. So you can see they have two distinct Vs making up this rope where if I turn it upside down, you have uh, one V in the center and then you have half a V each way. The Vs are upside down. But Nobody is really going to notice that unless they get very close in order to examine it. It's just as it's worn, it won't be uh, obvious at all. So I want to show you one more thing about the design of the sweater. This is what's called a modified drop shoulder. So when I got to the armhole, I bound off some stitches here and then I just went straight up where a set in sleeve would have some bind off and then it would be curved like this for a while. And then the actual sleeve would have like a shaped cap and all of that would fit in there and it would be a much more tailored look. So this is modified drop. So a drop shoulder would be something where you didn't bind off at all, you went straight up. And so that this would kind of hang over your shoulder a little bit. By, by doing some of this bind off, this brings in the armhole a little bit um, more in line, more similar to a set in sleeve, but, but really not that refined. So the way that the sleeve uh, is, is knit for one of these is at the top, you have a straight portion right here that is uh, as long as that is wide. So this is going to fit in to this hole this way. So this 
edge right here, this horizontal edge, it's horizontal as it was knit, this horizontal edge is going to get sewn into this vertical edge here. And then this edge right here will get sewn to that edge there. So if I wanted to knit it um, top down, but I wanted to knit it so that it was attached to the sweater and not seam it, that I could have done that, but then that would have had the whole sweater attached to the sleeve. I didn't want that. I wanted the smaller pieces and I'm pretty good at seaming so it doesn't bother me. Uh, but what I could have done was I could have picked up stitches along this edge here from the armhole up to the top and then from the top to the other armhole. And then I could have knit it flat until, I, until it was as long as this was a wide. And then I could, if I wanted to knit this in the round, I could. And so then at the very end, the only thing I would have to do would be to seam uh, this little bit of an edge to right here um, in order to, to complete it. So that's a modified drop shoulder uh, sweater. And I, I wanted to knit mine top down because I wanted uh, to knit the, most of the length of the sweater and then seam it in and then try it on. I'm probably going to do the neck after I get this sleeve done. I may not even complete this sleeve until I get the other one done and I'll have to, to sew some things up and make sure I have the length right. But I really do like to uh, fine tune the length of the sleeve. I also want to make sure that I'm going to end at a, at a good place in the pattern so that the when it, it joins into the ribbing it will make sense and not just sort of abruptly end in some random place within uh, the cable repeat. So I, I want to time that and I'm and based on my row gauge I'm pretty sure of where I'll probably end but I have a couple of choices and then I can decide how long I actually do want the ribbing and do I want it long enough so I can fold it back or do I just want to have a, a cup that's a couple inches long. So these are decisions I haven't uh, made yet and so I want to leave myself open uh, in case I change my mind. Uh, later. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.